Thanks, Tom, and uh, thanks to the directors for the invitation to speak at this conference. It has been, an abs for, for me, certainly an, an absolutely incredible event, um, so congratulations for staging such an excellent uh, conference. Um, this work really discusses some of the research we've been doing around cold plasmas as a potential alternative to antimicrobial conventional antibiotics, for example. Um, our interests initially were with human pathogens, but thanks to um, a generous grant from the BBSRC, um, who th uh, I thank for sponsoring this session also, we've been able to start looking at using cold plasmas in the agri-food space, and that's our focus today. However, I was struck last night by the uh, commonalities, certainly in terms of the debate between the antibiotic face, space, pharma, and farmer. In antibiotic discovery, we discovered a about 60%, 70% of the clinically useful drugs were discovered between 1940 and 1960, what we call the golden age of antibiotic discovery. Now this timeline shows on the top the discovery uh, timeline and the emergence of resistance on the bottom. And as you can see, anthropogenic human use of antibiotics very rapidly leads to the emergence of antibiotic resistance. Another thing to point out in terms here is you'll notice that after kind of 1970, the pipeline runs dry. In fact, in 2018, we only approved four new antibiotics. And when I say new, I mean uh, derivative antibiotics that belong to already known classes. Four of them were tetracyclines. So something's happening here. We've, there's been a decoupling of profit from a public good. Now, antibiotics are arguably one of the most important public goods produced by the pharma industry. They boast an ability to extend life. They're cheap and available. But that lack of value that we've placed in them, uh, monetary value, has led to their widespread overuse and emergence of resistance. So when you decouple profit from production of a public good, what we see is a hollowing out of that industry with a mass exodus, as we see, of the big pharma players moving from that space. That means that antibiotics in the future are going to be much more expensive, and there's a discussion to be had around the impact of that increased expense among antibiotics. We know the, the figures from the O'Neill report, um, 10 million deaths per annum by 2015 if the threat is not adequately addressed, and a cumulative loss um, of productivity, et cetera, a cumulative cost of up to $1 trillion, uh, equivalent of taking twice the UK GDP from the world um, economy. So it's serious. Part of the work that I was involved in was a Wellcome Trust Department of Health uh, pipeline portfolio review of the alternatives to antibiotics. So assuming that we run out of antibiotics, what are those alternatives? We looked at a very wide range, over 19 candidates for um, uh, alternatives to antibiotics. What did we find? Well, we found that none of those were ready to come to the market within the next 15 to 20 years. It would take a considerable investment and considerable collaboration and translation to do that. But also, um, of those alternatives, none are in a position to completely supplant the use of antibiotics. The take home message is that we still need antibiotics. We rely on them, um, and they are the cornerstone of modern medicine, and in some cases, modern agriculture as well. Why have I put up a picture of the Large Hadron Collider and the International Space Station, well, it's quite simple. For antibiotic resistance to move to big science, which is what's really required to address the problem, we need funding somewhere between the Large Hadron Collider, which cost around 16 million pounds, to the International Space Station, 96 billion pounds. So somewhere in between that figure is where we need to position research into antimicrobial resistance. One of the things that we've been looking at at Queen's are non-thermal plasmas. Now, people will ask, what is a non-thermal plasma? I'll explain what a plasma is to begin with. A plasma is simply a very energetic gas where you've got a, a partially or wholly ionized gas. And we can do that by adding energy into the system. It's referred to as the fourth state of matter because you've got um, solid liquid gas followed by plasma. And plasmas make up 99% of the observable universe. They're formed um, when gases become energized. And things like the aurora, uh, solar flares, stars, lightning, but also more useful things like uh, neon advertising. Um, other beers are available. Um, or where plasmas have found their typical use, strip lighting, for example, are plasmas. Plasmas create a very energetic uh, system. Um, and you can, we can use that energetic system to ionize the gas, the air around it, the, the plasma production, 
to produce biocidal species. The biocidal species are activated by the uh, introduction of an electric, high electric field and are, when switched off, disappear again. They're, so it leaves no residue behind. There are essentially two representations of the plasma. One is this, the first one here on the uh, right-hand side is the dielectric barrier discharge system. And that's where the sample, and in some cases the patient themselves, uh, form the part of the circuit. Now, lots of patients don't like to think of themselves as an electrode, but it's not necessary to tell them that. Um, you can place your sample between those two electrodes and initiate the production of the plasma. The other one is a plasma jet where you flow gas through a, a tube and ha it, within that tube apply a very high electric field. It ionizes the gas and then that propagates into the air around it and um, produces a plasma effluent, which is what you use or afterglow to expose your sample. So that's what a dielectric barrier discharge looks like in real life and a plasma jet. Now these can be arrayed to give you much larger surface areas to allow you to take this into higher value uh, production. This is the cold plasma field. It's a fairly nascent field. It's only about 20 years old. Um, and in fact, plasmas in agriculture has only re really been a focus of this field since 2016. The first workshop was held in Philadelphia in 2016 for plasmas in agriculture. However, the cold plasma market is estimated, a recent market report estimates it being worth 50 1.3 billion by 2026, with a predicted combined annual growth rate of around 16% between 2018 and 2026, driven primarily by applications in the agri-food sector. So these are some of those applications. Increased germination and yield, plasma-generated nitrate fertilizer, so taking nitrate from the air, nitrogen from the air, and converting it into nitrate and nitrites in liquids. Reduced bacterial count uh, at harvest, but also in, during production and storage. Degradation of chemical risks in the food chain, like pesticides. Reduced food waste, etc. Enhanced shelf life. Plasma activated liquids for decontamination and so forth. Seems to be stuck. Apologies. This is a plasma jet. Now, the figure in the center here is actually a slowdown ionization. Um, the plasma looks continuous, but actually is a series of plasma bullets. And coming from the bottom of the tube into that effluent space, we'll notice that that little plasma bullet, a little ionization wave, interacts with the air where it creates a cascade of ionization. That's what hits our sample. Now, these travel at about uh, 50 to 90 kilometers per second. So it appears as a continuous pulsed wave. But by pulsing the plasma, we can keep the temperature to around 37 degrees Celsius. So that opens up a whole range of potential tissue tolerable, but also processing parameters that we can't do with hot plasmas. So the ability to generate plasmas at or around ambient temperature has opened up this area of plasma medicine and now applications in uh, plasma uh, in agriculture and food. The little cartoon here shows that within that plasma uh, zone, within that tube, you get photons, electrons, metastable uh, excited species, electric fields, etc. And then coming from the bottom of the tube, you've got all these uh, hydrogen peroxide, hydroxide radicals, lots of different biocidal oxygen and nitrogen, reactive oxygen and nitrogen species, which then interact with your sample. We've looked at um, the six most important, as identified by the Infectious Diseases Society of America, the six most important pathogens, the escape pathogens as they're referred to. And what we see with that is even when grown in their most resistant form as biofilms, they're still highly susceptible to plasma. The exception here in the yellow box has been Acinetobacter bimaniae, which causes really chronic wound infections and is a real issue in hospitals where it can hang around for five, six months on surfaces and still cause infections. So um, we're looking at understanding how those resistance and tolerance profiles happen. The BBSRC project that I mentioned, the aim was to understand and to develop atmospheric cold plasma-based systems for uh, controlling not only microbiological risks in the food chain, but also chemical risks. Uh, what do I mean by that? Well, we looked at uh, mycotoxin degradation with Professor Chris Elliott, and we found rapid degradation both in laboratory 
standard conditions, but also on grains, maize grains, for example, reduction of mycotoxins, rapidly reduced in uh, mycotoxin load in those. We also looked at another important area relevant to AMR, and that's antibiotic residues in wastewater streams. And we found that we could rapidly degrade by exposing antibiotics in wastewater streams, we could rapidly degrade those antibiotic residues. And when we fed those degraded residues back to bacteria, exposed them again and again, they did, the, they did not develop resistance, indicating that those plasma degraded antibiotics had actually uh, no uh, stress on the bacteria, which would lead to the emergence of resistance. Finally, um, we were very grateful to Innovate UK through the Centre for Innovation Excellence in uh, Livestock. Um, to have a capital grant to set up this AgriPlaz laboratory. And that's really what I wanted to mention here today. The AgriPlaz laboratory uh, has a number of bespoke and also proprietary plasma systems. And the goal of that uh, laboratory, through collaboration with the farming community and the agri-food community, is to reduce animal disease, reduce antibiotic use in the food chain, reduce feed and food contamination, and reduce food waste by, for example, extension of uh, shelf life through in-packet uh, plasma generation, etc. So, just to thank the uh, sponsors of the work, and also I look forward to conversations uh, on how we can translate the technology.